our leaders to sign treaties. They are cousins in France, from France, who are also doing the same in different parts of Africa, in the western part. They are cousins from Germany, who are also doing the same in Dahomey, in what is now Namibia, in what was then known as Tanganyika. They were also in Cameroon, and their cousin from Portugal were also doing the same it was in what is now Cabo Verde, Guinea-Bissau, Angola, Mozambique, Sao Tome and Principe. Their cousins from Belgium were doing the same in what was then known as Rwanda and Urundi. And they were also doing the same in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Their cousins from Italy were doing the same in Libya. They were doing the same in Somalia. Their cousins from Spain were doing the same in Equatorial Guinea. They were here. And what they did is that they devised different ways of dividing us. In fact, the British were so blatant as to say and adopt a policy that they referred to as divide and conquer. So they came here and they made you believe that the Bagandai were your enemies. They made you believe that the Basoga were your enemies. They made you believe that the people who had the same color and culture like yourself were your enemies. And we believed. It was in direct rule. They set brother against brother and sister against sister. That is how colors they were. They took land that belonged to one brother and gave to the other. They even took mountains, Kilimanjaro, and gave themselves as gifts. And our lakes they named after themselves. Narubare, they called Lake Victoria, and we still call it Lake Victoria. They came here, and even the lake for which you had a name, they called Albert. The lake for which you had a name, they called Edward. When they went to Zambia, they called them Livingston and Victoria, and abandoned Mosi Otunya. They came here, and even you and me, they gave us names. So that you are no longer a Simwe, but you are Donald. So that I'm no longer Otieno Lumumba, I'm Patrick. That is how they did it. Our minds were corrupted. And when they had corrupted our minds, we fought against them. We fought against them here in Uganda, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Ghana, in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, in Nigeria. We expelled them, but they never went away. They are still here. They are still controlling us in very subtle ways. We use their language. I would have preferred to speak in Kiswahili or Lunyoro. We use their names. We worship in churches that they have created. We abandoned our gods. Our God. Even the name of our God they took away from us. This is who they are. And they have not changed. Let you not be cheated. So that today, when we are present here, and we are talking about our grievances, we must identify our enemies. Our brothers are not our enemies. They are our enemies. You know, when you go to South Africa, sometimes I hear my brothers and sisters in South Africa claiming that those Africans from up north are their enemies. They forget that their enemies are the whites who constructed the apartheid regime. You know, when I come here to Bunyoro Kitara Empire, and I hear uh, the Bunyoro talk about empire, 
In my mother tongue, which is the Luo, we call it Pakruok. And I know that when we were moving from Sudan, my people settled here. And those of you who are familiar with the history of the Bunyoro Kitara Kingdom, they were here for some time. And indeed, when we were moving down to what is now Kenya, the Banyala, seeing us, referred to us as Omunyolo because they thought we were the Banyoro. So that even today in Kenya, those of the Luhias called the Luo Omunyolo, thinking that they are the Banyoro. That is how connected we are. So that when we talk about territory, you must remember that territory must never be the basis of conflict. Indeed, our leading historians tell us that one piece of land could be used by several communities. The cow herder could use the same land as the tiller of the land. In those days before the white man came here, we did not have title deeds. So today when we are talking about the grievances and the conflict, that make us unhappy and angry. Those conflicts, let me tell you honestly and candidly, some of them will not be solved in your lifetime. They'll be solved long after you are gone. Your duty is to always remind your generations that there is a conflict to be resolved. You know, when I travel across the world, and you meet people of Jewish tradition. Even those who were born seven years ago talk about the Holocaust in 1940s. The grievance is passed from generation to generation. And if you think that the problems that afflict you today will be solved in your lifetime, you will be disappointed. But if you know that the problems are intergenerational, you will not be disappointed because you will recognize that it is a relay race. A friend of mine tells me, and I agree with him, that when you want to eat an elephant, you cannot swallow the elephant, but you can eat the elephant piece by piece. The problems that confront us are like the elephant. When we want to eat them, we eat them piece by piece. And after a long time, we will sit down when we are satisfied and your children and children's children will tell a story that there was an elephant that confronted us and we ate it. And people will wonder, how did they eat the elephant? And we will be able to tell them piece by piece, generation by generation. And that is why, when I look at the history of the Bunyoro Kitara Empire, and I met the Bunyoro Kitara Empire as a standard five student, when we were learning the history of East Africa, when we were learning about the kingdoms of Africa, and I remember learning about the Bunyoro Kitara Kingdom. And I remember learning about the Buganda Kingdom. And I remember learning about the Busoga and the Toro and all these kingdoms. And I remember being taught about Omukama Kavarega, who was seized in 1899, and you know the story and who resisted the British and who was taken away through Kismayo ultimately to the seashells and who as you know died on his way here in 1923. He did a great job and history remembers him for resisting our enemy. Sometimes you don't have to win the battle immediately. Your contribution is that you fought and fought a good fight. Last night, I spent a night at a facility called the Kabarega Resort, uh, Resorts. The Omukama Kabarega 
is dead. Long live Kabareka. Because he never dies. When you do good things, what happens is that your mortal remains appear to die, but you never die. You who are his progeny are alive, and you keep him alive. And we are here not because we have the monopoly of wisdom. We are here because we know we have a problem which is elephantine. And we know that combining our wisdom and our efforts, that problem can be eaten. And we are going to eat it piece by piece. And we are going to eat it with wisdom. We are going to recruit those who are our allies. We have too many enemies. We must not create new ones. What we must do is to get our allies. The Bunyoro, a strong Bunyoro Kitara empire is good for Uganda. I'm a student of history and I know when the kingdoms were abolished. I know when the kingdoms were reinstated. I know how the kingdoms are operating. I know that Uganda is richer because of the kingdoms. I know, as Philip has rightly said, that the kings have soft power. And there is nothing stronger than soft power. Wow. You know, somebody was telling me only yesterday that if you want to know soft power, look at the egg, whether of a chicken or any egg. When you break it from outside, you destroy the egg. But when it is broken from inside, it produces a chick. Let us be wise how we use our power. Do we want to break the egg from outside or we want to break the egg from inside? Choose you now. As for me, I choose to break the egg from inside because when I do so, I'm aware that life will be produced. And in this battle that you are talking about, you are not the only ones who are fighting this battle. I remember as a young law student, in my second year of study, my professor, who was my teacher in the law of property in land, came to class. And on the very first day, during the very first lecture, he said, we are going to study the law of property in land, not land law, the law of property in land. And we are going to discuss this because the last colonial question is the question of land. The British came here in Uganda and what they took was land that we did not own land. They therefore said that the person who owns land is their king and they gave us title deeds in the name of their queen. And we took them, and they subdivided them into little pieces. And they taught us that our little pieces must then be fenced. And that once you fenced it, if your brother crosses on your side, your brother or sister becomes your enemy. They created enmity by imposing on us a land, on us a land tenure system which was alien to us. We made land a God unto ourselves, which we worship, not knowing that the land liveth, but we die. The British came. Are they still here? Yes, they are. Are they still doing evil things to us? Yes, they are. How? Because they owe us money. They owe us things. They took our things. They were thieves, and they are still thieves. If you go to their museums, you find the artifacts which have no value at all. They are beyond being measured in money. The sentimental value and the historical and spiritual value of the nine-legged stool is incalculable in any currency. But they keep them. They still want to control us. 
they owe us some money, a lot of money, which they can never pay. Even if they pay us something, it will, it will only be a token and we'll only accept it because in the larger scheme of things, we are all human beings. But we want them to atone for their sins and to come out as the French president recently came out and name each country, each kingdom and come and say, I look forward to the day. When the British Prime Minister will stand on the floor of the House of Commons and make the following speech. We the British, animated by greed and selfishness, <laughs> left our little island and went into different parts of the world. We went to Africa, we went to Asia, we went to the Americas, and we found a civilized and a welcoming people. They welcomed us, but we abused and insulted them. We killed them in their millions. We took their property. Over the years, we have refused to do that which is good and right. But God has now visited our minds and hearts, and we now want to apologize to all of them name by name. We apologize to the Bunyoro Kitara Kingdom for the atrocities that we committed unto them. We apologize for taking their king, Kavarega, and exiling him to Kismayu and the seashells. We apologize for taking their artifacts. We know that the damage we occasioned to them cannot be compensated but we are offering merely as a token of our appreciation and atonement for our sins, which are otherwise unforgivable, one trillion United States dollars. We want them to say that. We want them to move out of Bunyoro Kitara Kingdom and go to the Baganda and say, we confused you a little, but ultimately we also punished you. We ask for your forgiveness. They go to the Toro and they go out into different parts of Africa, they come to Kenya and tell the Mau Mau and the sons and descendants of the Mau Mau, we know we harmed you. They go to South Africa, they go to Zambia, they go to Nigeria and to Benin Empire and to the Yoruba and to the Igbo and to the Hausa and to the Fulani and to the Temne and to the Mende in Sierra Leone and to the Wolof, the French who do that and they apologize. It is not going to be easy because they have pride and arrogance. But even the ghost of arrogance can be exercised if we pray hard enough. And we will help them to exercise by being wise. The Lake Albert, what they call Lake Albert, has a name. Is it a Manzige? Buitanzige. <laughs> means that the Nzige cannot cross it, they die there. Let us tell the British that they have met Buitanzige. This time round they will not cross. And I am very happy is that God in his divine and majestic wisdom has caused oil. Not to be discovered, it was always there. <laughs> but for oil to be available at this time in our history, and that oil, if we use it well, is going to change the lives, and I hope it will, of the people of this area of the Bunyoro Kitara Empire. Look forward to the day when after that oil, has been extracted that every home and every hamlet in the Bunyoro Kitara kingdom will have gas. You shall no longer use wood. I look forward to that day. I look forward to the day when that oil, when it has been refined, the proceeds will be so well utilized that your hostel will be so good that your schools will be so good, that your roads will be so good, that your retirement schemes will be so good, 
that your life expectancy will be so good, that everything will be so good, that life expectancy and infant mortality will reduce and maternal mortality will reduce and everything will be so good, not only in Bunyoro Kitara Empire, but also in the whole of Uganda. And not only the whole of Uganda, but the whole of East Africa, that that oil will find its way to South Sudan and we will consume it there. That that oil will find itself to Uganda and Tanzania and Rwanda and Burundi and the Democratic Republic of Congo and Somalia. And all of us will say with one accord, we are but children of the same God. And that oil, you, the Bunyoro Kitara Empire, are only the custodians of it. I look forward to that day. I look forward to a heart so generous. And I look forward to the government of the Republic of Uganda represented here by my sister Jennifer, that they shall work with the Bunyoro Kitara Empire so very intimately that my good friend and the president of Uganda, Iweri Kaguta Museveni, shall be a good midwife. <laughs> and the role of a midwife is very simple, to ensure that the mother is well and the child is well so that everybody is happy at the end of the day. And if that is the truth, is it not then proper that I invite my very good friend, Dr. Wallace Williams, to say something about how that oil has been utilized in different parts of the world to create goodness and joy. That when you have a problem and you think that you have an enemy, you can disarm your enemy in many ways. You can act with the arrogance and with the entitlement that energizes their anger towards you, that makes them now say, if you want war, let it be war, and let the chips fall where they may. Or you can act with firmness and wisdom that the scales on their eyes will fall out and their wax in their ears will melt. I am encouraging the people of Bunyoro Kitara Empire that we must act with the firmness that will remove the scales from the eyes of our brothers and sisters and with the firmness that will melt their wax that they may be able to say we are brothers. I always Remember these words after the civil war in Nigeria. When the then president of Nigeria, Yakubu Gowan, was receiving the surrender of the generals in Biafra. And these were his words after a bitter war where over one million were lost. I paraphrase. My brother. I'm glad to see you. It has been a bitter and painful war, but we are brothers. Because all these things that we fight about are given to us by God. And I conclude with this story which is known to you. Many of us when we went to school learned about a man called Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, at age 33, had conquered three quarters of the known world. A young man. He died. Round about where it's called the Levant. And when he was about to die, surrounded by the best doctors known to the world at that time, he called his five generals and told them, I know I'm about to die. When I die, as I surely will, this is what I want to be done. I want my casket to be carried by my doctors, the best. I want my coffin to be designed in such a way that when I rest in it, my arms will be outstretched, the both of them. And my message to the world is this, that the world may know 
that when it is your time to die, whether you are surrounded by the best doctors in the world, you will die. And I want my arms to be as straight that the world may know that no matter how great you are, no matter how rich you are, when you leave the world, you leave empty-handed. If we learn that from Alexander the Great, we will learn to be humble. In the law we say, Nipinyo siko toksikie. The world is forever, but we are not forever. And that is what we must realize. In the next 40 years, it is these young people who will be here about Africa. We must engage them in this conversation. Let us plant in their minds and hearts the seeds of brotherhood and sisterhood. And that starts with them being good citizens of Bunyoro Kitara. As I said, a good citizen of Bunyoro Kitara will be a good citizen of Uganda. A good citizen of Uganda will be a good citizen of, Af of East Africa. A good citizen of East Africa will be a good citizen of Africa. A good citizen of Africa will be a good citizen of the world. And if you pray to God and do the right things, you will also be a good citizen of heaven. Because otherwise I'm told the rules of heaven may be a little different. But I want to assume that if you are good, even the heavens will know that you are good.